Let me down. Good afternoon. We're ready to call this very first initial meeting of the Kentucky Opioid Abatement Advisory Commission to order. I'd like to welcome our members who have made the trip here to Frankfurt, as well as all of our engaged citizens and members of the press who have also arrived today. For those who are here who may wish to speak, there is a sign-up sheet on that table that is reserved for five individuals that will be allocated four minutes each at the end of this meeting to share whatever might be on your heart and mind with this commission today. For those who are with the press, we will have a press availability for about 20 minutes or so after the conclusion of this meeting. And before we get started off with official business, there are some folks who need to be recognized and thanked for all of the work that has led us here to this moment this afternoon. And if they happen to be here, as I say your name, if you don't mind, please stand. I'd like to start off by recognizing the Executive Director of the Attorney General's Office of Consumer Protection, Mr. Chris Lewis, Assistant Deputy Attorney General, Christopher Thacker, and our Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Victor Maddox, for all the work they and their team have done in the course of litigating and settling these cases with both the opioid manufacturers and the distributors. But for the work that you have completed thus far, we would not be at this table. I would also like to thank those who have participated in the setup of not just this room today, but all of the organizational infrastructure that is going to be a part of our meetings from here out. Ms. Elizabeth Kuhn, who is the Director of Communications for the Office of Attorney General, Ms. Krista Buckle, who is Deputy Director of Communications, and Mr. Trenton Armstrong, who is the Assistant Communications Director for Digital Media for the Office of Attorney General. And then last but not least, I would like to thank Mr. Blake Christopher, for being the point man for this project for several months now, for fielding all of the telephone calls, for taking a swipe at drafting the initial set of regulations, and for being a good and faithful colleague to make sure that my paints get put on the right way, <laughs> and that I don't get lost walking through the hallway. Thank you very much. And if we could, I'd like to give a round of applause for all of these folks collectively. This time we shall call the roll. Treasurer Allison Ball. Here. Representative Danny Bentley. He sends his regrets due to his attendance at the Legislators Conference in Oklahoma City. Mr. Vic Brown. Here. Ms. Karen Butcher. Here. Mr. Carlos Cameron. Here. Secretary Eric Friedlander. Here. Mr. Van Ingram. Here. Ms. Von Purdy. Here. Dr. Jason Root. Here. Dr. Sharon Walsh. Here. Thank you all. Right. This Apologies. Uh, Representative Bentley just joined via Zoom. All right. As they say, better late than never. <laughs> First behind getting his camera activated here, but he has joined us. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. If it's all right, starting with Ms. Purdy, and for the benefit of the public that may be joining us uh, by the YouTube link, I would ask that the individual members introduce themselves and just give us a little bit of their personal and professional background so that our neighbors and friends know exactly who's sitting around this table. 
Ms. Purdy, we'll start with you. Good afternoon. My name is Vaughn Purdy. I am Vice President of Community Engagement and Institutional Advancement at Simmons College of Kentucky in Louisville, Kentucky. <clears throat> I am very honored to be on this commission. Uh, I am a, nat a native of North Carolina and I've been in the Louisville, Kentucky area for about 10 years. I have uh, gone to undergraduate school in North Carolina at Winston-Salem State University, another historically black college and university. But I also have my master's degree from Miami, Ohio, uh, not too far from here in marketing and communications. Um, I currently work uh, at Simmons College of Kentucky to support, educate, and engage students uh, in our community about education and the importance of that. And I am very happy to be a part of this and a part of the community to point out uh, the issues that concern uh, us with this particular issue. I think it's all far reaching, not only uh, across the state, but in individual homes and zip codes across the country. So I am very proud to be a part of this. Thank you. My name is Carlos Cameron. I am the current Deputy District Director for Congressman Howard Rogers, incoming District Director as of August the 1st. I'm a Jackson County native, lifelong Kentucky resident. Uh, worked 10 years with Operation Unite, the Narcotics Task Force that Congressman Rogers had created several years ago. Um, before that, I had been in the private sector and got involved because of drugs in our community and the children that were raising. I wanted to raise them in a better place. I've now been with Congressman Rogers in this capacity for eight years, working in the district office. And as I said earlier, I'll take over as district director August 1st. I look forward to any of uh, anything we can do to assist, work with this commission to help the people of Kentucky fight this horrible problem we still face. And I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you for being here. Mr. Brown. I'm Vic Brown. I currently am the director of Appalachia HIDA, which is based in London. If you're not familiar with HIDA, it's a federal program that funds drug task forces in four states, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. I've been with HIDA for about 11 years. Prior to that, I retired from the Kentucky State Police where I served in various capacities, mainly in the eastern half of the state, and I'm very honored to be a part of this committee and look forward to working with you. I'm Allison Ball, I'm Kentucky State Treasurer, and uh, that job is an overseer of state funds. So uh, statutorily, I'm on here because of the money, but personally, I'm really honored to be a part of this because I was a prosecutor for about four years in my hometown, Prestonsburg. So I was assistant Floyd County attorney and in that capacity, I really got to encounter the drug problem in Eastern Kentucky. And it's something I deeply care about uh, at a statewide level and, of course, in my home area. So I'm honored to be a part of this and uh, just privileged to be a part of solutions to these problems. Hello. My name is Sharon Walsh, and I am a professor at the University of Kentucky, where I serve as the director of the Center on Drug and Alcohol Research. And um, I have been involved in conducting research on substance use and opioid use disorder specifically for about 30 years. First uh, 15 years at Hopkins, and I think I'm now 17 years at UK. And um, we have a very large community of people doing all kinds of different research uh, focused on this issue and are spread across our communities uh, throughout Kentucky. <clears throat> so my focus has really been on the development of treatments understanding the addictive qualities of drugs. And I've done a fair amount of um, consulting for the FDA and some sentencing guidelines, that, that type of thing, trying to bring <laughs> science to bear. Uh, but my focus has really been on uh, treatment primarily. And the reason that I am on this commission is that uh, I'm also the principal investigator of the Healing Community Study, which is an $87 million grant that was awarded to Kentucky to, uh, in 2019. And the goal of that is to bring an uh, integrated set of evidence-based practices into highly impacted communities in order to reduce opioid overdose deaths specifically. So we're about halfway through that project right now, and we have learned quite a bit. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jason Root. I currently serve as Executive Director uh, of the Technology Training Center at Campbellsville University. Uh, I'm also Adjunct Professor of Business uh, and I'm pastor at, at Asbury United Methodist Church in, in Campbellsville. And uh, I come to this commission, uh, obviously not uh, 
simply just because of my current titles and roles, but I was in active addiction for 17 years. Um, and I actually became homeless in 2012 before uh, entering treatment in 2013, originally from Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and I've been in recovery uh, for nine years and my current uh, research uh, is upon uh, the leadership qualities of people with substance use disorder. Uh, and so highlighting those traits uh, within people who struggle in substance abuse actually illuminates pathways to recovery and provides hope and purpose. And I'm excited to be part of this commission, uh, especially honored and humbled uh, at the role of representing the victims of the epidemic. It's very touching, it's very moving, um, and again, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm Karen Butcher. I've lived most of my life in Georgetown, Kentucky, I told you all the careers I've had and what I'm currently doing, you would not have time. Just say I have ADHD of the career. <laughs> However, I represent parents, uh, parents of addicted loved ones in particular is a group that uh, started in Arizona. We had the first Kentucky chapter in Georgetown. There are many of those. Those are support, support groups for parents, grandparents, and any other sober family members who wanna help someone in addiction, in recovery, whatever the case may be. My son, Matthew, passed away from an opioid overdose May 2022, or 20, sorry, 2020. So I'm here as the parent, and my PhD happens to be an experiential learning on the journey with opioid use with my son and uh, a lot of loved ones who are in town. Hi, my name is Van Ingram. Uh, I'm executive director of the Kentucky Office of Drug Control Policy. I'm in my 18th year there. Um, before that was 23 and a half years in Batesville, Kentucky Police Department. I want you to think, man, you're in your late 40s, the math doesn't add up, but <laughs> it really does. Um, so I was there for 20, 23 and a half years, the last six as chief of police. The time we're gonna to spend together is critical. Um, we've lost 107,000 Americans in 2021 of a fatal drug overdose, more than 70% of those involved fentanyl. Here in Kentucky, we set another record, 2,250 deaths, 72.9% contain fentanyl. Um, statistically, it's killing six of our people every day. So these dollars that we're gonna uh, oversee are critical to the future of, uh, of our state. So I'm honored to be here and, and grateful for the opportunity. Thanks. Secretary. Uh, I'm Eric Friedlander, Secretary of the Cabinet for Health and Family Services. Began working there in 1985, so uh, I began working there before any of you all. <laughs> uh, cabinet's a big cabinet, uh, Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities, uh, Department of Community-Based Services, Medicaid, Public Health, um, all the places across, um, in many ways, state government that they can impact and have an impact on uh, substance use. Uh, an opioid uh, misuse. Um, and I, I come at it from two personal perspectives. One, I've, I've had friends that have died from overdose uh, and friends who have been addicted and friends who are on MAT to this day and know that that, that has saved their lives. Um, two, uh, like I said, I've been at the cabinet since 1985 and I remember being lied to. I remember when I was writing the regulations for the Office of the Inspector General pharmaceutical companies coming in and saying, oh, nobody needs to feel pain anymore. That's an outdated model. These, these, these drugs don't cause addiction. And they were lying. And they knew they were lying. And they were lying across state government. And they were lying even to me. And I remember that. And that's why I'm glad to be here. It's an honor to be here. And we, this is a small down payment those folks could make on the dollars that cost for us. Thank you, sir. I'm Brian Hubbard. I grew up in the coal fields of Virginia, and I say that with deliberate intention because of how wonderful and precious the people were who raised me, who taught me the values that I tried to honor, and sacrificed so much 
give me the education, lets me sit at a table with such a tremendous group of fine, accomplished individuals such as yourself. I graduated UK Law in the year 2000 and went to work for an insurance defense firm and spent the bulk of my private practice career practicing workers' comp law from one end of this state to the other, primarily on behalf of Walmart. There's not but about 10 counties that I think that I've not been into in this state, just about been inside of every Walmart store that there is. And I was present in what I would describe as the detonation event of this epidemic. That detonation event being the widespread, promiscuous, and illicit distribution of hardcore narcotic painkillers for the treatment of conditions that never should have received that treatment, and for the observation of the development of a very definable and ascertainable, what I described as Dr. Logger disability complex, which trafficked the misery of our fellow Kentuckians in order to generate revenue on the law side and on the medical side. It was a substantial contributor to the problems that we're facing now. In 2017, I had an opportunity to transition into state government and serve first as deputy commissioner of the Department for Income Support overseeing the administration of the state social security disability program. And then in September of 17 was named commissioner. And that came to include the administration of the state's child support enforcement program. And there was a tremendous amount of intersection and overlap between each of those programs and what I had saw as problems that were developing within our social fabric in those years of private practice. And I am very proud to have become employed by Attorney General Jen, uh, Daniel Cameron, first as Executive Director of the Office of Medicaid Fraud and Abuse Control, and now here as Chair and Executive Director of this commission. And on behalf of General Cameron, I wish to express his regret that he could not be present for this initial meeting. But he wants to make sure that everyone in here understands his deep appreciation for your commitment to your fellow Kentuckians to help us address a terrible problem with high odds of, of um, intractability. And he will be here to see and visit with us as we engage in and pursue this very important work. Now, before we get into the presentation, then I have asked that uh, Director Ingram and Dr. Parks perform. Oh, yes, that's right. Representative Bentley has joined us. I see his face. Before we get into business, Representative Bentley, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I sure can. I'm in Oklahoma City at the memorial at the um, National Memorial Museum. And they let me out here and going to let me back in. So I ask them real nice. If you've never been here uh, to Oklahoma City to see where the tragedy happened, I suggest you come by. You can feel the spirit of the people here that died in that. I went to several meetings here in Oklahoma City, and I went to a two-hour meeting where they used the word recovery, but never used the word recovering. And it was from all the Southern states legislators. So that brings into mind that some judges that who was presenting the program are still not acute of the pharmacology of opioids. So I will tell you a little bit about my history. I was reared in Greenup County, went to McHale High School. My whole family had been blue collar workers and the first in my family to get a college education. After uh, I had an academic scholarship in pre-med to Eastern, graduated from the University of Kentucky with a BS and a doctor of pharmacy. I graduated in 73 in 1990. When I graduated in 90, my only purpose in life was to go back to Northeast Kentucky to help people. And so what I didn't know I was getting into at that time and opened my own independent up in 1990 was that there was a crisis coming down the Ohio River. And it was called opium, opium, opium. <laughs> and a lot of people didn't realize the difference between an opioid and an opiate. And it was interesting when I first came to Frankfurt, we were writing laws just saying the word opiate. And then we had to start talking about all the derivatives of fentanyl and it was just that people weren't educated who were supposed to be educated. And so there was a lot of waste of time just on the wording on the first opioid bills. So I spent 50 years behind the counter in pharmacies. I've been threatened. I've dealt with junkies. Um, I've arrested five people in one day. So 
not only am I a state representative, I've also practiced it real life. I know what it's like to live south of Huntington, West Virginia, and know that between Huntington and Charleston, West Virginia is the main route for eastern Kentucky and eastern United States coming out of Dayton, Ohio, and uh, Detroit. I've had people who went undercover and uh, new policemen that never did come home. So on the practical side, and then on the state representative side, I thank you for having me on this commission. And when we sponsored this bill, I was the sponsor of it. So you see the purposes that we have, those 29 purposes, hopefully that um, we have written it correctly. And this all is there to help the people of Kentucky. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bentley. Um, we, we have two substantive agenda items on dock today. We will get to those after we receive the presentation from Director Ingram and Dr. Katie Marks. That is going to educate all of us as to the way in which resources are currently allocated throughout the state's infrastructure to address opioid dependence and, and addiction issues. After we do that and receive that presentation, we'll get into the proposed subcommittee structure, the assignment of membership to those subcommittees, and we will vote on approval of the meeting dates that will carry us forward for our business meetings from now until the end of the year. And so far as we approach 2.30, we will take a brief five minute break for everybody's relief before we get back into uh, the substantive portions of the agenda. At this time, I would like to introduce Executive Director Ingram and Dr. Katie Marks. A podium has been set up down there for y'all to utilize as you see fit and you deliver the material you have prepared for us today. And thank you both very much for the time and effort that you have put into this. Thank you, Director Hubbard. Uh, Dr. Marks is going to lead off and then I'll follow up. Dr. Marks, would you mind to just brag on yourself a little bit? <laughs> us, I know who you are. I'd be happy to. Let me start my gratitude, though, and thank the commission for the opportunity to speak not just on behalf of CORE, the Kentucky Opioid Response Effort, but what CORE represents, which is so many individuals and communities and programs and partners that have come together since 2017 to, uh, to work towards solutions, towards uh, a recovering Kentucky. And uh, I'm just grateful to share what we've done so far. I wish that I had 35 hours and not 35 minutes. I could tell you so much. Um, but I imagine this will be a long conversation over the coming months and years. It's also an opportunity to present beside Van Ingram, you know, of all of the assets we have in Kentucky, having a director of the Office of Drug Control Policy that understands the values that we understand, that is the first to say that we're not going to arrest our way out of this, is one of our truest assets in the state. So thank you. Myself, Katie Marks, I'm the project director for four. Uh, I have been within the Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental, and Intellectual Disabilities since 2017. And I came to that by way of uh, graduate work at the University of Kentucky studying behavioral science and uh, a degree in experimental psychology. I am, gosh, I wasn't prepared to brag on myself in any way other than to say that uh, I come with a perspective of bringing the science to bear to the community and also having spent many years in the community understanding what they need and what makes sense. So I hope to merge those two together for us today. And with that, we will start to work through slides. So as I said, uh, CORE came into fruition in 2017 as a result of SAMHSA grants, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, that uh, come in two-year increments. Every two years, they are re-approved at the congressional level. And they have given us a very specific mission. And we've taken that and said, thank you, but we're going to do some more. We're, we're going to create a collective. We're going to create something much bigger than a set of grants. And, um, and so we created a statement of purpose, which is a little bigger than even the grant itself, which is to be guided by a recovery-oriented system of care and to have the purpose of implementing a comprehensive and targeted response to Kentucky's opioid uh, crisis by expanding equitable access to a full continuum of prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery support services. Perfect, we are, we are safe. So the structure of CORE, I want just to quickly orient you to how we operate and where we are, we live within as I said, the Department for Behavioral Health Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities under Commissioner Wendy Morris and with the direction of our medical director, Dr. Alan Brinsel. 
Uh, and we are within the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, which you heard from Secretary Friedlander just a second ago. We partner so closely, and this has been integral to our success with public health, Medicaid, uh, DCBS, our child welfare, and the Inspector General's office. We meet monthly. We've been meeting monthly since 2017 to talk about what our straight state strategies look like. We've missed three meetings since then, three meetings since 2017. If you ever need a pick me up kind of day, come to a state implementation team meeting. There's so much energy and hunger for solutions. We also partner with a wide array of other entities in the state, our justice and public safety cabinet. I'll say Van's name 30 times in the next 35 minutes, uh, but also closely with corrections, public advocacy, our amazing partner at administrative office for the courts, our university partnerships, having that strong scientific basis to guide us, uh, close partnership with the healing community study. And then our community partners, which really are the voice in we're working harder to increase that voice of community partners in the state. So I want to orient you to how we're going to think about describing the core initiatives and strategies. And what we use is a cascade of care framework. This is a way of thinking about intervention points that go across the continuum of care for an individual. And so we start with uh, thinking about how we prevent or reduce the harms of initiation of use how we prevent that transition to misuse, how we then identify treatment needs early, and then we provide treatment access and the engagement to help bring people into that access we've created. We support treatment retention. We know that that's a critical step, and, step, and then we sustain long-term remission and recovery. What you'll see, oh, one, one back, please. What you'll see really importantly throughout all of this is the idea that harm reduction lives across the continuum. There is the opportunity to continually reduce harm at every stage of the way. Just as if we recognize that we continue to put our seatbelts on, even when we're experienced drivers, we can continue to provide harm reduction access uh, throughout the continuum. And harm reduction is kind of two things. It's both a set of practical strategies and ideas, ideas like respect and dignity, um, but also strategies, some classic ones that we talk about, like naloxone access. Um, but it's also the reduction of the inherent harms of substance use and the imposed harms of substance use. And by that, I mean what we do to people that have opioid use disorder. And then we, of course, have to address the personal and family and recovery capital that subsumes everything that we do, that really wraps it all together. And so as I go through this, I'm going to talk about prevention initiatives, treatment, recovery, but I'm going to start at a place of infrastructure in just a few seconds because if we took all this and wrapped it together, infrastructure is what sets the foundation for all of our initiatives and is a unique uh, dynamic that only organizations and entities like us can build. Next slide. All right. Along with that, I, you'll see my academic background. I'm like, how about another framework? How about another uh, theoretical model? But this one's straightforward. And these are just some guiding principles for us. And there's, there's four of them. As we expand service access, it's more complicated than just access, right? We want to increase access, which is do services exist? But not just are they available, but are they accessible? Can people get to them? Can people afford them? And not just do they exist and can people get to them, are they the right services for that individual? Are they acceptable? Are they person-centered? Are they culturally appropriate? And then last, which could be first, is quality. It, we must be offering quality services that are evidence-based and harm reduction, uh, quality or, hmm, that are evidence-based. And so once we address availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality, then we're really changing our system of care. So what is CORE done? I'm just going to talk about what we have done in the past year, fiscal year 21 specifically. We operated 67 contracts, and within those, there are 156 projects or initiatives. Think of a project as something really big still, like uh, naloxone distribution across the whole state is one project, or uh, co-locating reentry care coordinators with our jail substance abuse programming. That would be another project. So 156 programs or initiatives means hundreds, literally, of activities that are led by our community partners and state partners. We reached 14,000 unduplicated individuals with treatment services, another 9,000 with recovery-specific support services. 
almost 54,000 uh, two dose units of naloxone distributed in that year. And importantly, this number, almost 7,000 opioid overdose reversals or replacements, what that means is that someone came back to a syringe service program and either said, I used this naloxone, I need another, or will you replace that? And so that's the counting. That's how we count those two with the challenging number of counts. So that's the scale. In terms of priority populations, this is per our grant. We have four. So of course, people who have experienced an opioid overdose in the past are at highest risk for subsequent overdose. So we prioritize those individuals, pregnant and parenting women and their families. Uh, I heard several people spot, speak to uh, not just the individual, but the impact of families, uh, the intergenerational impact that we can address. And so that's a priority. Justice involved individuals. I need not dive with this group into the impact of uh, opioids on our criminal justice system and vice versa. We know their vulnerability for overdose when they return to the community. And then marginalized and minority groups. 2021 was the first year that rates of overdose death for Black Kentuckians exceeded that for White Kentuckians, and it is uh, upon us, it is our, our responsibility to increase the equitable services that we deliver. All right, so 10 minutes in, we're going to start with what are we doing? And like I said, we would start with the infrastructure, the basis for all of this. Each little hexagon describes an initiative or a program. If you see a hexagon, you're excited about. We'll talk more about it later, but a few things that I'm going to skim over but want you to hear that we do uh, a lot of work in the service equity space in our workforce capacity. I think you'll hear that from people. We really need a stronger and more equipped and uh, trained workforce. Uh, data infrastructure is really important to what we do, but I'll talk about two primarily. The first being um, on the next slide are uh, our Unshamed campaign. Stigma is central to what is created and sustains our opioid crisis at this point. And multiple levels of stigma. Stigma at the individual level, self-stigma. Stigma towards other people. Stigma towards the systems or the system stigma towards people. And then stigma towards medications for opioid use disorder specifically. And so the Unshamed campaign is a statewide anti-stigma initiative. Uh, it's launched largely through sharing stories of people recovering. Um, you can see just little pictures of some of those tidbits here. Uh, and also, it's bringing people together to create experiences of conversation and uh, kind of a learning collaborative of sorts. And so you can see, and this is in partnership with Shatterproof, which has been amazing. The reach of this is really phenomenal, and it's just gotten started in the past few months. An impression, which means someone that ever so briefly maybe saw uh, a social media image or a piece of information, 865,000 in the past month. Uh, we reach on average 20,000 individuals a day with this message. Um, we have 59 community partners today. We would love to see that grow. So I think this is a great platform to expand upon uh, with many different partners. The other infrastructure piece I wanted to quickly highlight was the Kentucky Recovery Housing Network. This is operated by our Department for Behavioral Health, and its goal is to create safe and quality recovery housing. I think we've all talked about recovery housing uh, many times in the past, and what we recognize is that we lack a sufficient number of recovery houses, but we also lack a sufficient number of safe, conducive spaces for recovery and spaces that also support all paths to recovery, which also includes medication. And so what the Kentucky Recovery Housing Network is creating is doing is creating space for both education on the best practices, the opportunity to certify houses. This is voluntary, it's free, a certification process to the national standard, which is the National Alliance of Recovery Residences, which says, if you do this, this, and this, and have these recommended policies, we think that you've created a safe, healthy environment that recovery can uh, occur in. It also provides technical assistance, uh, reference policies and procedures, and has a community advisory board. It's growing. It's still, uh, it's still in its uh, first two years. We have 32 certified houses, another 20 in progress, 339 beds at this point, and at least another 177 probably certified in the next two months. Prevention and harm reduction. So now we're going to move into different initiatives across this continuum. And so I'm going to talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary 
harm reduction, or sorry, prevention, which really just means preventing it in a general population, preventing it for people that are at risk, and then how do we handle those that have started to use substances? Again, a wide array of initiatives that you um, can see on the screen. I wish I could talk about every last one of them, but I won't for Van's sake. Uh, so overdose education and naloxone <coughs> education. Naloxone is a life-saving medication that reverses the effect of overdose. Uh, the brand name most commonly known is Narcan. And uh, we see as one of our number one priorities is increasing access to naloxone by distributing it through several different strategies, through our community-based distribution, uh, which includes health departments and core funded programs uh, in close collaboration with ODCP and the funds that they provide for that, in partnership with our healing community study and the sustainability that, that, that will come in the next year, uh, mobile harm reduction and naloxone kiosks that are coming. Uh, so on average, we're distributing about 5,000 a month, but I can tell you very certainly that we are not distributing enough naloxone on our own. Uh, the, the demand is high, which is really exciting in Kentucky, and the opportunities to get it co-located into more spaces into our corrections so that everyone walking out uh, of incarceration has it in hand. When you uh, have an EMS run and someone decides not to come to the hospital with you, you at least leave them naloxone. So many opportunities. To increase that distribution. And you see, just, just to indulge a little bit some data, we do track where naloxone goes throughout the state um, to the best of our ability. And so this is just a bit of a heat map where we can track that. Also, pharmacy initiated distribution and co prescribing are other important strategies in this process. We just launched a naloxone copay program so that we can encourage people to access their pharmacy benefit. Um, Medicaid, for example, all the NCOs cover a uh, two dose monthly. Uh, naloxone, uh, but to remove that cost for some people that might have a copay. Next slide. Oh, that is. <laughs> Sorry, it's all maps. Um, in the harm reduction space, really we're talking about two things, saving lives and facilitating access for treatment. I spoke a little bit about the principles of harm reduction earlier, and there's three key areas that I wanted to focus on for this. First is expansion of our syringe service programs. What you can see uh, on the screen is a map of the location of all of our operating syringe service programs in Kentucky. And then the pink represents the counties that are most vulnerable for an HIV or uh, HIV or HCV, HCV infection outbreak. And maybe not just county, the region in which they're most vulnerable. And so syringe service programs off, off, operate on a shoestring budget. I've learned from um, leaders in the health department space that, that anything with a comma in it is a lot of money. And so our ability to really grow the, uh, the ability of these syringe service programs to operate more off hours, to have more staff, to distribute more resources is an investment well made. Also increasing access to digital test distribution and mobile harm reduction. You'll hear me say mobile time, mobile a few times. The recognition that we have to get out of our, our buildings and go into the street and literally and figuratively, figuratively meet people where we at is absolutely urgent. I think uh, certainly COVID taught us that if we hadn't, shouldn't have already learned that lesson a long time ago. I'll also say on that slide, and we can stay there, that our partnership with um, the Kentucky uh, Department for Public Health has been incredible. The support of um, the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition, uh, the Harm Reduction Branch within PPH, and the Kentucky Pharmacists Association, there are a lot of people doing a lot of work to centralize these resources and get them out into the community. Thank you. So another aspect of the prevention space is statewide opioid stewardship of the Kentucky Hospital Association. So what we mean by stewardship is reducing over over opioid overprescribing and also increasing uh, safer use. This is a really exciting kind of one of a kind in the country model where the Kentucky Hospital Association has taken this on uh, head on and said, we are willing to, to, to lead this by presenting to our association on a monthly basis, evidence-based practice and trainings, to getting the commitments of 112 of our hospitals to these steward, to these standards, and then holding them accountable through metrics and monitoring, and also giving the hospitals a space to be recognized for the good work that they're doing. 
And so the, it's just an incredible partnership that has allowed us to uh, continue to improve our safe opioid prescribing and also to start to address pain and uh, evidence-based management uh, for chronic pain, particularly in our primary care settings. Another asset we have in Kentucky that we're working to build is our regional prevention centers. Regional prevention centers are all associated with our community mental health centers across the state, and they're really true infrastructure. They're building regional capacity for primary prevention. They have a long list of activities they engage in, community mobilization, technical assistance, but I wanted to highlight just three for you. One is uh, their distribution of safe storage and disposal resources. This includes both personal state safe storage bags and also working with pharmacies to create spaces where people can return um, unused prescriptions. They also uh, have worked to expand access to sources of strength and too good for drugs. These are two evidence-based uh, interventions that are really very much primary prevention. So building resilience, reducing risk factors. And so through sources of strength, we've got 97 schools and too good for drugs, another 230 schools involved. Um, schools have been really receptive to this work. And it's not just providing this curriculum to the schools. Every school that's engaged has also uh, revised their policies and procedures to uh, have yeah, better policies and procedures for how we handle the mental health crises and behavioral health crises. And so um, a lot of area to grow in this present intervention space. Okay, treatment strategies. I'm going to dive right in. We're going to talk about outreach, engagement, and retention here. Next slide, please. The basis of our treatment strategies is medications, medications for opioid disorder. The, the evidence is uh, unequivocal. It reduces use, craving, return to use. It reduces overdose, mortality, recidivism, infectious disease transmission. It increases treatment uh, retention and it creates opportunity for choice and collaboration. And so ensuring that medication access is a part of everything CORE does is not just a requirement of our federal funders, it is truly fundamental to what it means to create uh, an evidence-based system of care. So quick response teams, I get excited. I don't know if you can, I can't really modulate. I stay high, high on the <laughs> excitement scale throughout, but quick response teams are just doing such amazing work. They are providing a sort of outreach and engagement into the community. These are combinations of locally designed peer support specialists, EMS, different first responders, uh, treatment providers that show up post overdose or even better before an overdose and in a crisis and say, we're here to help in any way you need. Uh, we can work with the individual, we can support the family, we can link you to services, we can follow up after you've been linked to services to see how that went. If you need more support, we can stay there with you. Uh, the compassion, the driving force of lived experience, uh, the uh, ability to understand what's happening at, at a local community level is, is almost unrivaled. The treatment linkage success within the core funded programs right now is 57% on average. It's pretty remarkable. More than half of people accept, have to accept treatment services when they're engaged by a QRP. That little map shows where we're reaching and more importantly, where we're not reaching yet. There's so much room to grow in the space. Hospital service models. We also know that our hospitals, hospitals can serve as a, as a pathway to treatment, as a no wrong door approach. And so we've created, through inspiration from others, really uh, kind of a four tier system where we think about how our major university hospital hubs are, uh, our higher volume and lower volume hospitals, and even our small hospitals can all adopt some version of the following model. When someone comes into the emergency department or even the hospital in general, we have the ability to identify that treatment is needed to address opioid withdrawal and treat it as the medical emergency that it is, to co-locate or bring in peer support or a navigator that's here to say, I've been where you are and I know how to get you to the next level and I'm gonna follow you through that uh, if you're willing to accept that. And here's naloxone, here's Narcan, we know that you're gonna need that and in some cases, we've got clinics that are co-located in the hospital where people can go right next door and continue services. In other cases, we've built a strong network of community partners that can take someone the same day or the next. 
Uh, the idea is the urgency of the ability to treat. We're not saying come back to us in two weeks, then we'll start to talk about your opioid withdrawal and treat treated that day because we know what the consequences are if we send someone home in active withdrawal. Treatment access programs. We have two different treatment access programs that have been really important to CORE's growth, and I want to talk about both of them. But at the end of the day, they're both designed to support both access and retention for people that are uninsured or underinsured. We have a strong benefit in Kentucky to pay for services, but we know that there are also some folks that, that slip through the cracks. And so the first program is the treatment access program. And this is targeting specifically access to residential levels of care. Uh, and also that step down to IOP. And so what this can do is if someone needs residential services and they are, do not currently have insurance, they don't have to wait to get insurance or can pay for that uh, treatment in that interim. Uh, if they are, if they have Medicare, Medicare does not cover residential services at all. I hope everyone knows that. Then we can step in and pay for that as well. And we've got a number of providers. It is a requirement that uh, all providers that participate before um, are, are licensed credential which offer medications the standard. Uh, and historically, we've also included a room and board benefit with that, which means that once you complete residential and IOP to help retain people in care longer, we um, have paid for a room and board service up to 60 days. That model is no longer financially sustainable for the grant that we see. And so we are moving to a more community-based uh, model, but I think the opportunity to leverage additional funds in different ways to support the treatment access program, I think is an important conversation to have early on. And then also the methadone access program. Uh, this pays for the weekly rate of methadone for people that are on or underinsured. It operates very similar in that uh, the client eligibility is the same. It's present in all of our methadone programs, with the exception of one across the state. And that's just a little map if you're curious to see where our methadone programs are. Next slide. So I talked about kind of the residential level of care, but increasing capacity for primary care for outpatient treatment has been an important priority of four. Um, it also lowers the barriers to treatment. People can remain in their community. They can remain uh, in their jobs while they're accessing services. And they can also get multiple services with one visit, which is really important. The Kentucky Primary Care Association has been an amazing partner in supporting this expansion because not only are they supporting their federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics in growing, but they've taken on their own kind of growth and learning experience so that they have the institutional knowledge to support uh, the, the, the evidence-based model and, and perpetuity, I like to imagine. So what do we offer? We offer um, peer support specialists. So uh, an FQHC, if they want to participate, can bring a peer onto their team, a case manager, a court can pay for transportation services to treatment. And then KPCA as a whole offers the trainings and technical assistance. Again, you see I like maps. This is the map of the uh, current programs that are involved. Again, you see more light spaces than dark spaces. There's so much room to grow in this model. Oh, I alluded to it or mentioned it a couple times. This is a real area of growth for us, especially as regulations are changing across the state, that we can go out and physically be present, not just to engage people and bring them into our brick and mortar, but to stay out in the community and continue to provide those services. And it can look so many different ways. We have a, a community mental health center that has a mobile clinic and they're just driving around the pathways region, uh, operating uh, their, their clinic hours. They are working to add the capacity to um, fully provide treatment services in that setting. It's just amazing. Uh, it's not just it's not just housing in unstably housed or homeless individuals. It is rural communities that lack access to treatment. There's so many opportunities to uh, address equity issues through mobile services. Uh, in Louisville, the Kentucky Harm Reduction Unit, along with the University of Louisville Clinic, is setting up shop every week downtown Louisville. And uh, just you should see the little table they set up. People come and they engage and they provide services. Mobile recovery support services. You don't have to be just a brick and mortar recovery community center. You can put it on wheels. And then uh, even methadone going mobile into uh, jails and into residential programs. All right, busy slide, but I wanted to capture a number. Actually, could we go to the top with our little box? Uh, for treatment access pilots for justice-involved individuals. And so, perfect. 
You can see uh, this is just the map of the sequential intercept model, which is a fancy term to say this is the continuum of services when you're in the justice system, starting with law enforcement and going to community uh, corrections. And what you see below that are just different initiatives at different stages. And so obviously quick response teams at the crisis stage, but uh, doing pretrial care coordination, we're piloting a model where as soon as you enter pretrial trial, people are asked one question, do you need any help with your substance use? Uh, and if they say yes, they're connected with community mental health center and then services can be linked through there. Alternative sentencing and the ability to provide recovery supports so that people can in fact adhere to their alternative sentence so that they can uh, receive their treatment services in the community. Bringing medication access into our jails and prisons, bringing methadone access into our jails, bringing peers in FQHCs into our jails and, and prisons, you see the, the trend. And then facilitating reentry coordination. And so a couple different things. Our jail reentry care coordinators are co-located with all substance abuse programs, which is the DOC Department of Corrections run uh, treatment that they offer. And so really helping them to access identification cards to get connected with your treatment provider to receive that overdose education and the lockdown uh, distribution. And then if I have time to talk on it, reentry employment support. This was a program that began at the beginning of core and it said, what if we take probation or parole officers and make them employment support specialists? And again, if you're looking for the list of things to do on a bad day, go talk to a reentry employment support specialist. They have the best jobs in the world. They just get to help people attain jobs and go out in the community and talk about what a wonderful program it is. And it's been remarkable. Uh, we are seeing evidence that it reduces incarceration rates. And then administrative office of the courts, their restore initiative, that is the infrastructure that is training courts and judges and partners to understand what evidence-based treatment could look like in the justice system. And I jumped the gun, but this is the jail reentry coordinator slide. You can see where they're located. And I will just keep moving on in the interest of time. Um, of course, the last slide in treatment, but arguably could have been the first, is the integrated and coordinated care models for pregnant and parenting family. Uh, we fund several different programs, and I won't belabor all the different models, but at the end of the day, what's important to know is that care coordination and nurse care navigation is really, really effective to help link a really complicated and important set of services together. And so linking our OB care with our OUD treatment, with our parenting education and child care and transport and employment, if you have someone that can really case manage that well with the expertise of understanding what care for pregnant women, women look like, it, yeah, it does, it works. And we know that it's important, not just for mothers, it's important for babies. It demonstrates reduction in uh, NAS rates. It creates healthier bonding and attachment. It is, um, and so we can put this model together, it works really well. All right, recovery capital strategies. I will probably go through these faster. Sometimes I say I should just start with recovery because it's my favorite place to talk, um, but we'll go to the next slide. Access to recovery program. This is really unique in Kentucky in partnership with Faki, which has been really wonderful. Um, we have access to recovery coordinators that are, have the ability to do a recovery capital assessment to say, what are your assets in recovery and what are your barriers? And when we, when we identify barriers like basic needs or recovery housing or uh, transportation or child care, these ATR partners can pay for those services. Um, and it could really make the difference between uh, a tenuous early recovery and a more stable early recovery. And so they're located in 27, that sounds generous, um, counties in the state. It's a partnership. We've created funding with our Department for Behavioral Health and their Substance Abuse Block Grant. That's why you see two different colors here, but they're functionally connected, but the ability to address the barriers of people in recovery to support their ongoing treatment engagement is absolutely critical in what we do. Recovery community centers. Recovery community centers are physical spaces where people can come together and access services and also just be in community with each other. And so uh, it's not clinical, it's not recovery housing, it's a place where you get mutual aid, employment support, approach social activities. The list I found is endless. <coughs> they do. Um, we have 10 throughout the state. 
Uh, I think that, and many people think that we could use a recovery community center in absolutely every county in the state. Housing expansion, we're, we're nearing the end of, of what I hope to share with you today. Uh, two different initiatives. The, uh, we have funded the, the expansion of recovery housing. We offer notice of funding opportunities or RFPs to uh, increase capacity for housing over time, but also our Oxford House. I just want you to know that we have this evidence-based model in Kentucky called Oxford House, and uh, we have 100 of them in the state, which is really remarkable. And uh, what our job has been to do is to help sustain that network that's there and slowly grow it as their capacity uh, expands. And so uh, we, on a daily basis, are growing about 20 new houses in our Transformational employment. So you've heard second chance employment, that's a common term. We like to push it just a little bit further and say transformational employment because it's really a transformation of both the individual, the employee, and their employer. And change, the employer is changing their, their uh, practices, their hiring practices, their retention practices, while, of course, an individual is also working on their own recovery. And we know, I need not say in this room, what having employment does for an individual, not just an individual in recovery, an individual, period. And so I mentioned our reentry uh, employment administrators, but also um, our partnership with the um, career centers across the state with the strategic initiative for transformational employment um, that funds both employment specialists in our career centers and also uh, employer resource networks to bring employers together to really uh, share some of the, the retention specialist capacity. 200. 200% increase in employment in the past uh, year is what we see on average with this initiative. All right, okay. It is 34 minutes in. Um, we've had the opportunity to write about uh, where CORE is going in the next two years. We have our uh, SAMHSA grant going in in two days. And so I just wanted to, and I'll leave these here for you. I won't dive into them deeply, but when I think about where we want to grow, what's important to me, what's important to the teams I ask them, workforce, uh, equitable service access, and in scale, we have evidence-based practices. We have um, promising practices. We need to replicate that which is effective statewide. And this is just a list of some of them. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dan. Thank you for your attention. Next slide. So I was talking to Secretary Freelander a while back, and I said, the thing with Dr. Marks is the passion. <laughs> and she's really, really smart. And on the other hand, only possess one of those qualities. <laughs> and it's the first one. Um, 2015, we were seeing a real heroin resurgence in Kentucky. And, and General Assembly worked on a bill that became Senate Bill 192. Um, that bill had a lot of harm reduction strategies in it. It had a good spirit provision in it. Um, it allowed for syringe service programs in communities for public health to run. Um, had some good things in it, but it did something that I've never seen General Assembly do before. They put some funding with a bill so we could start to address this issue. That first year, 2015, was $10 million. Um, and over the years, with uh, Governor Bevan and Governor Bashir, it's been a increased to about $16 million to our office a year, a little over 16, to address some programs that the General, that the General Assembly outlined, plus some new ones. Um, I, I want to go over just a few of those uh, if I can. But one of the things General Assembly asked us to fund was we have our local ASAP boards. If you don't know what they are, they're kind of like an anti-drug community coalition. They're folks at the local level who are working on policy and working on programs at the local level to reduce substance abuse disorder in their communities. Um, typically, I we get tobacco, that, that money came from the tobacco settlement fund, kind of like the money that we're gonna be overseeing. Uh, it was a master settlement, and it set aside some money for this. Um, we get about three million in change to do that. So what we do is we give every county $25,000, so we have multi-county boards. We have some boards that have a number of counties, and then we have what we call single county boards. But they, we make sure that every county is represented with about $25,000. And then what this other program does is harm reduction awards. 
we approached the local ASAP boards and say, if you want to write a grant to do something in your community, in addition to that $25,000, we'll take a look at it. So in 2021, we gave about $1.3 $1 million on change to do things like supporting syringe service programs, to do things like prevention in schools, to do things like um, a number of activities around supporting treatment in the community, supporting prevention in the community. Um, third, tomorrow or Friday, um, or by Friday, my office will release an annual report. It'll be on our website. You can kind of go on there and dig through the report. You'll see what every county is doing with the funds they get. And I would encourage you to do that because there's way more projects than I could ever list that come out of that $1.3 billion in addition to 25000 So that's one of the things that we're, we're grateful to be able to fund. Another program that had been going around Franklin for a long time, and I had testified many times for the General Assembly to try to increase that, was alternative sentencing workers. They work within the Department of Public Advocacy. And there are things that a person might tell their attorney or tell someone in the Department of Public Advocacy that they may not tell anybody else. So what we found out was these alternative social workers, alternative sentencing workers, and they're usually social workers, um, can identify things like chronic homelessness, like substance use disorder, like mental health disorders, things that are, that are causing that person to recycle into the criminal justice system over and over again. And they're able to work with prosecutors and work out maybe a sentence that makes more sense than just incarceration. It provides some services to that person. So we spent about $2 million funding that program. Next slide. The General Assembly also asked us to fund neonatal abstinence programs, places that take care of pregnant and pregnant parenting women with an opioid use disorder. And we have a, some really good ones in this state. I, I hesitate to start naming them, but we have Crystal's House, Independence House, uh, Healy Place for Women, um, Karen's Place. We have a, a, a number of really good programs in Kentucky. Uh, but they need help, they need funding. And so we've worked with them the last several years for grants to expand their ability to keep moms longer after delivery. We know that we, Dr. Marks talked about safe housing, talked about reliable housing and evidence-based housing. Well, we know our needle abstinence centers, they can provide that. They'll provide really good care and really good service. So we're, we're, we're granting them money to try to lengthen that stay for that mom and her children. General Assembly also asked us to work with community mental health centers and grant money to them. I will tell you our early focus was on increasing medications to treat opioid use disorder at the at community level. Lately, we've turned to a couple of different other things, and that is, again, transitional housing. And we really learned a lot through COVID that there were a lot of folks that could benefit from a telehealth model, but the community mental health centers did not, a lot of them didn't have the infrastructure to support that. You know, transportation is a huge issue in this state. Just getting to an appointment three times a week is a big deal to a lot of people. But if we can provide a tablet, they can get there once a week, and then twice a week we, we could do a virtual visit. That's better than nothing. That's better than, than not making it at all. So we're going to focus. We did some focus on that last year. We'll probably do some focus on that again this year to increase that. Another program we, that we find on these dollars is a, is a Unite call, a call center that Operation Unite runs for us. I used to get so aggravated. I'd watch these commercials on TV with this guy with a lab coat, a stethoscope, talking about call our addiction hotline. And all they are is a, is a third party vendor that gets kicked back for sending somebody to a specific treatment program without any interest in how the quality of that program. I wanted a place where Kentucky people could call a Kentucky number and talk to a Kentucky social worker that cares about them and their situation. And I've just been really pleased with this partnership. United has done a tremendous job running this program. They got really good people on the phones. Um, they get about 340, 50 calls a month. Uh, and then they redo reach out of about three times that much every month. So they're following up. You called last week. Have you made a decision? Is there anything I can do to help you? That kind of thing. Next slide. So I talked about the DPA program. The other program the General Assembly asked us to fund is a rocket docket program. And that's basically the same thing. Instead of on the public 
defender side, this is on the prosecution side, they're meeting with the alternative social workers saying, this person obviously has a substance use disorder. Maybe treatment would be a better option than, than prison. So we we spent two million on that, and they have some other funds as well. And they're in about sixty some counties. You heard Dr. March talk about our Department of Corrections. The largest treatment provider in Kentucky is the Department of Corrections, with nearly six thousand people receiving services every year. Um, it's huge, and they. A lot of it's halfway houses. Some of it is is, is peer led uh, treatment in the, in the prisons. A little bit in the jails. We're in about twenty three jails. Um, so we give three million dollars to uh, increase their ability to do treatment in prisons, to increase their ability to do treatment in jails, and to run a Vivitrol program. Vivitrol is a drug that you could take um, that blocks cravings and and, and prevents uh, if you do use an opioid. Of getting that uh, euphoric feeling, um, and so we we spent about three million dollars on that. Um, we spent about two hundred thousand dollars buying naloxone for law enforcement. One of the uh, complaints I heard when we start trying to encourage law enforcement agencies to carry naloxone is we're not budgeted for that, we're not funded for that. So I've removed that barrier. We'll fund it. All we ask is that you report to a certain to a database when you use it, and. Uh, we do about $200,000 a year for that. Next slide. Uh, Volunteers of America, we worked with them this year to expand. Uh, so they, they had an opportunity to obtain a, a safe living environment or a, a, a to keep clients longer. And we, we paid for the furniture for that. One of the other issues we've uh, dealt with this year, the last couple of years, is as the overdoses increased, the workload to our medical examiner's office increased dramatically. So we give them $900,000 a year in the last several years. And what we've done is we've co-located an individual from the Kentucky Injury Prevention Research Center with Dr. Ralston, the chief medical examiner. So Dr. Marks, Dr. Brenzel, and I and public health, we get monthly updates. Uh, we have a monthly, standing monthly meeting where we know what's gone on the previous month as far as... Uh, fatal overdoses, what drugs are involved. In addition to that, uh, the Injury Prevention Research Center provides us EMS data, hospital admission data, uh, emergency room data. And so we get a good clear picture every month of what's going on in the state. Um, Recovery Ready Communities, that's a project that we, we, we just funded this past year. Um, we partnered with uh, Volunteers of America Mid-States to operate that program. And we hope to roll out a, a draft the third week of September on what a recovery ready community should look like. It's gonna be a little challenging because we have communities that have tons of resources and we have communities that have virtually none. And we want every community to be able to participate. So it's gonna be a challenge to figure that out. Next slide. Um, you heard uh, Dr. Marks talk about the employment program. Uh, that program sits with the Eastern Kentucky Concentrated Employment Program or EK SEP. The thing with government money always comes with strings. But we find that state dollars don't come with near as many strings as the federal dollars. So we've divided this program up where I could pay for some things with state dollars that she would not be allowed to pay for with federal dollars. It's not enough sometimes just to find somebody a job. They have to have a way to get there. It, maybe they don't have the right clothes to wear to that job. Um, it might be that they don't have the right tools they need for that job. We use these funds to make sure they get there. And really, really quick story. And I, how, are we, how are we on time, Brian? We're all right, got about five minutes. Okay. <laughs> I was at, Dr. Marsh talked about the recovery community centers. I was at a training for them two weeks ago. And I've been sitting with these young ladies at this table all day. And they were from a community uh, center. They worked there in Richmond. And I kind of heard their stories and we, we talked, they shared their stories of their life and what they've been through, the trauma they've been through. When I got up to present the last presentation of the day, I talked about this program. And I come back and I sat down and this young lady looped me around the neck and she said, you paid for me to be a peer support specialist. You paid for my certification and the training I needed. So I've had that feeling of here's somebody that's directly impacted by the dollars. This did my heart good because sometimes we are behind desk and we're on Zoom meetings and we don't get to see like we, 
Jason, you know, I've been to, I was at the house many times, and I just don't get to do that as much anymore since COVID. It's just not as, as easy to get out as it used to be, or maybe we've got out of the habit we need to get back into. Uh, but I missed that interaction, and it was just fun that day. Um, transportation I talked about. We've, we're funding a program with, with the Department of Corrections for people who are on probation and parole. I asked parole officers, what's some of the things that causes problems for them? It's transportation, hands down. They can't get to a job interview. They can't get to their parole appointment. So we open this up to qualified individuals that if they have a demonstrated transportation need, we use the same providers that Medicaid uses. So we approached the, the non-emergency medical transport folks for Medicaid and said, would you haul our folks around if we paid you? Said, Absolutely. So we've since opened this up. I talked about those alternative social workers and now a lot of times they need a ride to treatment for the person they just worked out a deal for. So now we're paying for that as well out of that project. And then found a KSP, I, I, provide, I fund them for some inter, drug interdiction efforts on the highway, as in addition to a prevention, a mobile prevention uh, trailer that we put together that they take to county fairs, the state fair, and events all over the state. All right, I think we're done. Um, again, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Appreciate your willingness to hear what we're already spending a lot of money on. Uh, between Dr. Marks and I, we're looking at about $55 million this year. We did not go into be able to go into the kind of depth that we would need to at some point. Um, exactly how much and where and what. But uh, yeah, and Dr. Brenzel can tell you there's a lot of money on behavioral health on the block grant that's being spent on programs as well. But you could see from Dr. Marks' maps, we don't have anything at scale. We don't have anything that covers 120 counties. We just don't have enough money to do that. We've had to focus on here's the need, here's where we can find partners that will work with us. Um, but we don't have anything really to scale, do we, Dr. Marks? With that, if you all have any questions for either one of us, we'll be glad to, to entertain them. I just want to make sure that I heard what Vicar was quoting correctly, recognizing that what you had just said is that we don't have anything to scale. But really, we are just at the very beginning of developing the necessary infrastructure to address this problem. And that is to the tune of $55 million a year. Is that right? Yes, sir. Is that between between, between Dr. Office? Marsh's program and my office. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'd ask any individual questions be directed to Mr. Ingram and Dr. Marks afterward or through whatever preferred method of communication that they would prefer. Thank you both okay. very, very much for putting this information together and educating us as you have today. Um, <clears throat> is everybody good to roll or do we need to take a brief five minute break? Brief five minute break. We will take a brief five minute break and adjourn and we'll get back. Wrap up with the remainder of our agenda.
subcommittee structure, as well as the assignment of members to those subcommittees. I'm going to read out based on the forms which were presented in the, on the basis of the preferences expressed the committees in sequence. There has been a slight change given the number of people with which we have to work on this commission. We have consolidated treatment and recovery, and by doing so, we have managed to accommodate just about everybody's first expressed preference. So insofar as we have a subcommittee structure, those subcommittees will consist of the prevention subcommittee, the treatment and recovery subcommittee, and the reform and compliance subcommittee. The first two are fairly self-explanatory. The last one probably requires a little bit of explanation for our citizens as well as the gathered press here. We want to make sure that we avail ourselves of the opportunity to advise and make recommendations to the legislature as to those things which need to change within the legal environment of our state. The better put Kentucky for the purposes of dealing with everything that is related to this epidemic and its consequences. We also wish to make sure that we have good cooperation and recommendations to our professional boards and boards of licensure as to those things that need to be brought to bear for professionals engaged in substance use disorder work and to maximize those results, to ensure that we have good accountability and to also ensure that we address some of the ills that are beginning to appear throughout the state related to both treatment and recovery. And so without any further ado, for the prevention subcommittee, we are pleased to announce uh, CHFS Secretary Friedlander will serve on that along with Ms. Vaughn Purdy and Mr. Carlos Cameron. The Treatment and Recovery Subcommittee will consist of Ms. Karen Butcher, Dr. Sharon Walsh, and Mr. Van Ingram. And then the Reform and Compliance Committee will be comprised of Mr. Vic Brown, Treasurer Ball, Dr. Jason Roop, and Representative Danny Bentley. Is there any discussion among the commission related to either these committees or the assignments is made? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the subcommittee structure as well as the membership assignments? I move that we approve the committee structure. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. This says that I'm to have a roll call vote. Is that right, Clay? All right, we're good to go. Next thing is just kind of an informational update for the commission as well as the public on probably the most important component of public transparency that we're working on. And that relates to the website for this commission that is attached to the Office of Attorney General website. The goal of this is to make sure that the public can access information about what we, as well as those who are ultimately going to receive the money from this commission, as well as the cities and counties are doing to address the epidemic as charged by the General Assembly. We want to make sure that that website provides information that is transparent, comprehensive, 
accessible, and more importantly, understandable. And so I would at this time like to recognize Assistant Deputy Communication Director Krista Buckle, who's going to give us a brief overview of the skeleton that is coming uh, into being for this website. Right. Thank you so much, Brian. And I just want to thank the members of the commission for dedicating your time and attention to this weighty issue. We really appreciate that. I'm really happy to partner with you. So um, our communications team has put together a, a web page here that is dedicated to the Opioid Abatement Advisory Commission. Now, this is housed on the Attorney General's website. So that's the ag.ky.gov. Um, so it has basic information at this point, explains a little bit about the commission, has a member listing on the side there. Thank you, Carolyn, if you want to continue to scroll down a little bit more. Has some links to other uh, related pages like the opioid settlement. We also will continue to add additional meetings as those are set. Uh, there's a link to view each meeting on our YouTube page as well as agendas and minutes will be added here. And we'll continue to make changes to this page as needed to make sure that we keep step with your work and continue the transparency that's so important for the public as, as you get into the, the meat of the rest of your tasks. So uh, any questions? I will say one more thing, the page can very easily be accessed with a quick link, which is ag.ky.gov slash O-A-A-C. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, commission members, as questions, ideas, or concepts come into your mind as to how this web page either needs to look or the functionality features that you have, please feel free to send those to me. I will make sure that they reach the appropriate folks who are working on this part of the project. Next item on the agenda relates to the proposed meeting schedule. And let me just say that we're going to have two sets of meetings. The first will be our formal business meetings like this. And then the second will be those dates for the regional listening tour that we aim to begin starting in the month of September. It's the very first thing that we're going to take up now are the formal meeting dates. And again, members completed preferences as to those dates which work best for them. And we did our absolute best to accommodate everyone's expressed preferences as we set this schedule. So proposed for everyone's consideration is a business meeting on August the 29th, another business meeting on October the 4th, third business meeting on November the 15th, and then the last business meeting of the year will be December the 13th. Is there any discussion of this schedule? Here are none. Brian, I'm sorry, did you say August 29th? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Each of these four business meetings will be here at the Capitol East Complex. And that has an address of 1024 Capitol Center Drive, Suite 200, Conference Room A, Frankfort, Kentucky, 40601. And all of these meetings are open to the public and press. There will be a notification placed on the website once it's formally adopted by this commission. And notice and press advisories going out leading up to each one. Any discussion? Here are none. Is there a motion to approve the formal business meeting schedule? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Here are none. That's a unanimous passage of the meeting dates. The listening sessions, which were described in the email that was sent out last week, the dates will be finalized pending specific site locations. So at our August business meeting, which is set for August the 29th, we will take a formal vote to accept that schedule. However, as sites are confirmed along with their dates, I will be sending out regular email updates to every member here so that everyone knows the progress that we're making as to both the when and exact where of each of these. The cities which have been selected, I believe, were set forth in the email and for purposes of public consumption, those cities are going to be Pikeville, Ashland, Hazard, Covington, Lexington, Louisville, Bowling Green, and Paducah. And these will occur between the weeks of September the 19th and November the 28th of this year. And we hope to be able to pack the house at every single one of them. All right. Would you confirm the dates? So let's go to the press as well. Yes. So 
we absolutely will. There is a sign-up sheet that was placed over there for those who wish to make any comments. Um, and I say those who wish to make comments, I'm referring to those citizens who have shown up today. Uh, they will speak, and then at the conclusion of this meeting, we'll have availability for the press to the extent they wish to have it with us. So nobody signed up. Is there any members here or any citizens here? I see. Yes, ma'am. You can come right to this podium and please introduce yourself. You've got four minutes. My name is Dr. Sydney Cox. I'm the Sussex District Coordinator in um, Whitesburg, Kentucky at MCHC, Mount Carmel Health Corporation. We've worked with Mr. Ingram before. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the clinic as well as our community organizations that we've put together. We also go under the banner of Heal, but this in a different capacity. Um, but I'm here to ask there are unique needs that the people of Southeastern Kentucky face. Um, I'm not just in an administrative position, I also do a patient care. So I'm a, a service provider. Um, so we see very unique obstacles that many of the people in the rest of the state don't see. Um, like Mr. Ingram and Dr. Walsh indicated, transportation is a huge barrier um, to the point I think many don't recognize. Um, of the Southeastern Kentucky counties that comprise Central Appalachia, only four have public transport. Just four. None of those are in the southeastern part of the state. So Ledger County is where I'm located, about the southeastern as you can get. Um, and the only transportation our patients have is Medicaid reimburse services, and there's still lots of stipulations with that. Um, for example, one, you have to book 72 hours in advance. And those of you that have worked in the substance use field, how many people in addiction do you know that can do that? Um, one, it takes forward thinking that addiction knowledge your brain of, and two, that can be the difference in life and death for patients. Um, and they just don't have any other transportation option. So that's just something that I would ask everyone to consider, not just transportation, but also internet access is a huge problem. Um, I was just telling Mr. Cameron and Mr. Brown that my parents just got high speed internet two years ago, two years ago, and there are people that can afford to pay for that service. Most people in the community cannot. Um, so telehealth is a big obstacle for us as well. Um, so we just have very unique needs. I'd be happy to talk to any of you on that subject, um, just as someone that's a service provider that works directly with this population every single day, and um, to share some of that with you guys as to what might be beneficial. And I ask that you, when you move forward in the proposals um, and what services you plan to implement, consider that because a lot of times persons in Southeast Kentucky get a bad rep for not utilizing the resources that are provided to them. And it's not that they don't want them, they can't get to them. Um, so I would just ask that that be considered when you move forward. Thank you very much. Are there any other folks here who would like to speak to the commission? Okay. Two things. Number one is just to remind us of the timeline on which we are operating. It is our objective to have a website portal through which those who seek grants from this commission may submit their applications during the month of October. I'm not going to commit us to any specific time frame in October, given the nature and skill of the task. If we are able to get it cut on before Halloween turns midnight, we will call it a success. We will then aim to hopefully start receiving applications as soon as that website goes on. Um, we will do our best to publicize that collectively as a commission and then individually through our networks so that folks know and understand that it is available and ready. And we are prepared to begin the process of review. And then the next significant timeline will be in the month of January, whereby we hope to be able to make our first awards after we have sorted through applications as they have, as they have come in by committee and have gone through a selection process that brings the best of the best to this commission for formal action. We're starting this project at a time when public confidence in public institutions is at an all-time low. Public polling demonstrates that most folks who live in the United States from coast to coast believe that the mechanical infrastructure of government, insofar as it's not outright corrupt, it is completely incompetent. And the problem that we have been presented to solve is one that is tremendously difficult to resolve. And so as, it's, as it is as important to make an impact on the underlying problem, we will all do our very best to establish some baseline confidence with the folks here at home. 
that we are going to do our very best as transparently and as honestly and as much good faith as we can to get some traction on this as we move forward in our work together. And so without any further ado, I entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.